My name is Matthias Ross. I'm the Deputy Program Director of the BES uh, program, Bachelor of Environmental Studies program. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this first inaugural seminar of uh, what hopefully becomes a regular event uh, of the BES program. We already have another seminar planned for November and uh, October. It's only September, October and then November. So hopefully this will be a monthly series. Um, BES, of course, is a new program, as you know. Uh, it's in its second year now. We just took in the, the second batch of students. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary program that's jointly offered by the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, with participation from all other faculties and schools within the university. So as such, it's a truly unique program, interdisciplinary program, within NUS, within Singapore, and I dare to say worldwide. This is quite unique. It's great to see such uh, good attendance for this first seminar. I can see a lot of BS students here. Uh, yeah, right. Ooh. First year and second year students. So let's hear a cheer from the first year students again. What about the second year students? Okay, you have, to ha you have to do some catching up, I think. Uh, I can also see quite a few lecturers involved in the BES program. Uh, in, particu in particular, I'd like to welcome uh, the program director, Professor Chao Lok Meng. And beyond this, in particular, I'd like to welcome represent uh, representatives from the National uh, Environment Agency, which are re represented by Ms. Annie Tan, who is the Deputy Director of the Singapore Environment Institute, and uh, Mr. Liu Wenhui, the Assistant Director of the Singapore Environment Institute. The Singapore Environment Institute, of course, is a very important player in the environment arena in Singapore. It's a division of the National Environment Agency, and it's responsible for the dissemination and training of uh, environmental knowledge. And I've also had the opportunity to give a few presentations uh, as part of SCI's uh, outreach uh, activities, and I always enjoyed it tremendously. Um, NEA, SCI, has also been very helpful in organizing this seminar uh, by suggesting the topic and also providing a speaker today. So thank you very much for this. <laughs> Which brings me to the theme of today's presentations. We have actually two presentations, but the overarching theme is, and you can read this on the handout, climate system and haze issues, technology and impact. Uh, the format today is slightly different. We have two speakers uh, which talk about the same issue from slightly different perspectives. And I will now introduce the two speakers individually, sequentially, as they're going to appear here. And uh, each of them will speak for about 20 minutes. And we then have a discussion, which I will moderate, uh, which may last another 30 minutes or so. So be very careful. Listen carefully what they say. Uh, note down your questions. You should have a lot of questions. This is a very timely topic, obviously. It concerns all of us, all of us living here in Singapore and also the surrounding uh, countries, actually. Uh, so I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions. So the two speakers today, which will approach this topic, this issue from slightly different uh, perspectives. The first one is Dr. Jason Cohen, who will speak on introduction, or will give an introduction to the climate system and hay. So he will give us a more, uh, probably the theoretical basis to understand this, uh, this, this topic. Whereas the second speaker will look at it from a more practical vantage point. So uh, Dr. Cohen is a relatively new addition to NUS. He is an assistant professor here since June, July this year, right? Uh, but he's not new to Singapore. Before this, he was a postdoc with SMART, the Singapore MIT Research Alliance for Research and Technology, SMART. Thank you. 
Um, before that, he um, was a graduate student, PhD student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, studying climate systems. Actually, if I can get my notes here, I can tell you exactly what the title of his thesis was, because it's relevant. It's relevant to this presentation. Urban scale impacts on the global scale composition and climate effects and of anthropogenic aerosols. And that's what we're going to talk about and hear about today, the effects of anthropogenic aerosols. That's what Hayes is. His advisor was uh, Ronald Prynne. Uh, he has quite a substantial CV, but I just want to pick out one thing which caught my attention in the CV, and most of you probably don't know. Uh, he is actually also a very accomplished chess player. And he is the U.S. amateur individual and team champion from 15 years ago, roughly, 1995 and 1996. Okay. Okay, then Dr. Cohen will be followed by the speaker from NEA SEI, Mr. Ang Chiang Hai, who is also or oh, not also, he, he used to be an NUS, or is an NUS alumni. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, Dr. Cohen is now with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And Dr. Ang has also an engineering background as a civil engineer, where he did his undergraduate studies, I guess, and then for future studies, uh, specialization in meteorology, you did additional training in, or he did additional training in, with the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia which is a very well, uh, very respected uh, weather service provider. He is now a senior meteorological officer with NEA, involved in the provision of weather services uh, to users from various sectors, civil aviation, to, to the general public. But he is also involved in the environmental monitoring and analysis of meteorological satellite data. And that's, I think, what he is going to be talking about today primarily. Uh, and his title actually is Fires and Smoke Haze Monitoring Using Earth Observation Satellites. So that will then give us the more practical applied uh, perspective after we've heard from Dr. Cohen about the theoretical grounding um, background to uh, smoke haze pollution. Okay, without any further ado, I'd like to call on Dr. Cohen to give his presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Matthias, for the lovely introduction. Okay, so students, faculty, and honored guests today, uh, thank you for all coming. So uh, you can read the title up here. The one thing I wanted to point out to you, I'm going to be using a lot of photos as we go through at the beginning and at the end, so to try to visually clue you in. So this is a picture that I took about two and a half weeks ago when I was flying to the United States for a meeting. And I just randomly happened to capture this huge fire that was occurring outside in the western United States in a rather pristine and clean area. So the dimensions of this are about 100 kilometers long because I've gone under substantial zoom to get this shot here, just to give you an FYI of this issue from an aircraft, what it may look like. So to begin, uh, what exactly is haze? And so this is a picture that I took in 2011 when I was flying back from Australia over Indonesia. And you can see all these clouds around here, but you see this brown plume which sort of comes over the clouds and then spreads to the west. And this is a good example of haze. So what exactly is it? Well, it's a set of chemical species that is formed from combustion. And so some of these components you can visually see, as I've showed you in these two pictures here before. And the ones, the parts of haze that are relevant to climate include gases, such as CO2, methane, and carbon monoxide, and ozone, as well as aerosols. Now, it's the aerosols that we can visually see, and it's the aerosols I'm going to focus on, because while CO2, methane, and ozone are also all greenhouse gases, the total contribution of these from fires is small relative to their industrial sources 
whereas for BC and OC, the aerosol components, fires are a significant source of their total anthropogenic loading in the atmosphere. So uh, this one up here is not my picture, sorry. This is from a satellite. As you can see, this is Korea and China with a little bit of Japan sticking out here, just the visual effect of this haze and how much and what scales it can impact us at. This is a picture I took. This is downwind, about 200 kilometers, so already in Washington State from where the fire was that I showed you on the front page. Now you can see there's this sort of like brown layer. But this area, other than the city of Seattle, there is no large city within 500 kilometers of this area. And this was not in the direction of the wind from Seattle. So this very large, diffuse, brownish cloud that you see is a result of that fire that I had photographed about an hour earlier. So it is just spread over an enormous area. And so these fires can have an impact on the larger scale system. This is just a single large fire, as I showed you. So what are these aerosol components, which you can visually see? Well, they're actually little solid things suspended in the air. They're small in size. They're less than a micron in size. And black carbon, for example, is hydrophobic, so it doesn't rain out or it doesn't get removed by clouds from the system very well, which is why you can see it sort of coexisting with the clouds. So in you may have seen this before from the IPCC, the general global average radiative forcing of different species that people have put into the atmosphere to impact the climate. And so I'm focusing on this effect here, this direct effect of aerosols. So as you can see, the order of magnitude, the absolute order of magnitude is about on par of that with methane, where aerosols are roughly the second most important tied with methane, where CO2 is the single most important species. However, you'll notice aerosols in general are cooling, whereas greenhouse gases are warming. And so their effects on the climate system are different. Now, this is just a global average picture. And so when you look at black carbon, which is one of these two that comes from these fires, you'll see an effect. It's uncertain in the literature, ranging from about 0 0.2 watt per meter squared up to about 1 watt per meter squared. So it is significant on a global average. But as I'm going to show you and hopefully go through with you today, that the aerosols have a much larger effect on a regional basis. And over this region, I'm going to argue, are more important than CO2 if we're interested in climate effects on a regional basis. So how do these affect the climate? So CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases, they absorb outwelling infrared radiation from the surface. They absorb it in the atmosphere. And then they radiate some out to space and some back down to the Earth. So what they do is they warm the atmosphere and they warm the surface pretty uniformly throughout. These, these substances are pretty well mixed throughout the atmosphere. Aerosols, on the other hand, such as OC and BC from fires, work in the visible range. So sunlight coming in will hit these particles, these suspended particles I showed you pictures of. Some of the sunlight will bounce back out to space, cooling the Earth. However, these black particles, these gray particles, absorb sunlight too. You can imagine if you're something black and it's in the sun, it feels hot, correct? So it's absorbing that. And so these aerosols, they cool the surface because they shade from sun, but they heat the air. So you have a different set of physical effects than you do for the greenhouse gases. This is important because since they act in a different way, the impacts are likely going to be different. So how do we quantify these effects? Well, there's one term that we can use called AOD which I've written out for over here. But suffice to say, you have a plume of this aerosol stuff in the air. Sunlight comes in, and AOD is a way to quantify how much of the incoming sunlight that we see here is scattered or absorbed as compared to the amount that reaches the surface. So for AOD, the larger the number means the more sunlight that is not reaching the surface. So therefore, the more the surface is cooled and the more the air is warmed. And notice it's a logarithmic scale. The general global average AOD value ranges from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Anything over about 0 0.5, you can already visibly see. Just for example, if the AOD is around 1.5, you can look at the sun without hurting your eyes as a rough idea. So the number grows very quickly, and it's very important. So now I'm going to show you a picture. This is 10 years worth of monthly average data 
from the MISER satellite, which is one of the satellites that in NASA they've put up to measure this AOD. So as you can see from the region here, we just saw a big bloop in 2004. This is Southeast Asia, so you can see Thailand here, Singapore, Indonesia. So you'll notice that there's a lot of variation in this AOD, but now in 2006, as you probably saw, you got a huge blossoming of color, first over the northern part of Southeast Asia and then over our area later in the year. So as you can see, this AOD easily gets over these high values that I told you about, this 0.5 or this 1.0 threshold. But it's very variable in space and time. So how do we analyze this type of data if we want to try to quantify what the effect is? So when I show you this slide, I actually am going to thank, there's a student in the audience right now who is, I think so, Shishi, are you here? Okay, maybe not, sorry. <laughs> There's a student in the audience, or there's a student that was working with us when I was at SMART and is in engineering now, who helped apply certain algorithms to analyze that data. And so she helped contribute to this work. And so this is a methodology by which to analyze this data, to look for what is the important variability in this data. And as you can see, there's a pattern that comes up. This is a statistically coherent pattern, any value over about 1.5 to 2. So I put an outline of the 2 and an outline of the 3 levels. So it shows there's a spatial correlation in the data for the variability. If you notice, the spatial correlation corresponds very well with Sumatra, Singapore, Southern Malaysia, the South China Sea, and Borneo. Remember, this is from 10 years. Actually, the signal came from 12 years worth of the data because I've updated it with the last two years, 2010 and 2011. 2012, the data isn't out yet. Sorry, I can't capture that. And to make this stronger, there's a time variation in the data. I'm just showing a small snippet of this time piece. The larger the number means the more important that signal is. And if you notice, it's capturing October 2002, September, October, October 2004, September, October, November of 2006. It exclusively is capturing these months. Now, for those of you that were here in these times, you may remember that they were large fire burning haze events. And it's uniquely capturing this signal. So it's showing that there's an impact which is spanning thousands of kilometers from the east end of Borneo all the way over to Sumatra, which is consistent in both space and time with the known fire events that have occurred over these regions. So now we're not just talking a single type of fire. We're talking the fires are having impacts over thousands of kilometers and of a very strong amount. So this should have impacts on the climate system, not just some local type of effect. So in order to look at these better, uh, we've been using a model which was developed initially at MIT back in 2008 by some peers of mine, and I've done some co-development with this model as well. And here is the model described. It's a combination of an aerosol chemistry, aerosol physics, and climate model. The climate model is based on the US NCAR climate model version 3.1. So the first thing that I've done, we're not going to go through these equations. Don't worry about them. Just suffice to say there's a set of equations there, is to try to estimate what the emissions are of the black carbon and the organic carbon, because if we want to get at what the emissions from fires are, we have to know what the emissions are. And so you can use a complicated set of equations and come up with a value based on measurements. And this is very controversial. It's been under review for a while. And there's a lot of support now in the community for this result, because as I'll show you on another slide, when you compare it against the measurements, it actually matches the measurements, whereas people have known that the emissions have been too low versus measurements for a long time, but couldn't explain why. The value that we're coming up with is 17.8 teragrams a year of these emissions. The value that the IPCC is using is a vary between 7.6 to 8.8, and the value commonly used by the community is at 7.95. That's why it's very controversial. It's an order of magnitude larger. So they're also not equally distributed. As you can see, some areas of the world are increased, some are decreased. But I want to point out to you, Southeast Asia here is one of the three regions that even with the errors in the measurements associated is still statistically significantly higher than the value being used by the IPCC. Here, East Asia and Eastern Europe are the three regions. So 
it seems like what's going on in this region is people have underestimated the emissions of these aerosol products. But what could be the cause? So I'm going to try to convince you with some more data, and there's still more work to be done, that the fires are one of the major reasons of this cause, not a lack of knowledge of industry or too many industrial pollutants. So this has an impact on the global scale in terms of how the atmosphere responds. I'm getting an absorption for the atmosphere of 6.8 plus or minus 1.3. The IPCC has a value ranging from 2 to 3. So this will have significant climate impacts. Now, uh, this one isn't that important. Let's just go to comparisons with the data. So I chose stations that were in some of these regions that were underpredicted. So as you can see in India, when you run the IPCC emissions, you're just way too low compared to the measurements. When you run these emissions under different scenarios, you can match the annual average pretty well. At Taihu in China, you can match the measurements pretty well if you use certain assumptions based on the range. If you look, the IPCC emissions are too low. Jeju in Korea, they're too low. In Singapore, it's still too low, even with the enhanced emissions. However, as you notice, in each of these cases, there are spikes. In Jeju, Korea, you have this huge dust spike that occurred, and then you have your annual pollution spikes. In Taihu, it's the same thing. In Singapore, you have your burning events. We still can't match the measurements during these high-end events, which says that there are problems with how we deal with how much of the aerosol is coming from these fire events, and this is something we need to work on. But now I'm going to show you some of the climate impacts just using the new emissions and temporal pattern that I have, knowing that it still is underestimating these peak events. And you'll see that there are impacts on the climate system which are pretty significant. So how does a global model work? Well, for example, if you perturb, since I said there's an underestimation from East Asia, if you correct your underestimation from East Asia in all different seasons of the year, you'll notice that the pollution will either head out east over the Pacific Ocean, or in some seasons of the year, we'll head out east over the Pacific Ocean on some days and head out west over India and the Arabian Peninsula on other days. It's not that complicated. It basically flows east to west. This underestimation from Eastern Europe, as you'll see, flows east. Some of it will go out over Russia. Some of it will affect China, Korea, and Japan, and out over the Pacific, particularly in the summer. However, our underestimation of emissions from this area, because we're located in the near the equator, where we have the different monsoon season with strong vertical lifting during the rainy seasons, and we have a change, a perturbation in emissions here has a much more complicated effect. So as you can see, in certain seasons, the color balance on this isn't, uh, it doesn't show up as well as on my computer. But suffice to say that it makes the entire southern hemisphere red, just to a very small amount. So it has an impact on the absorption in the southern hemisphere. But it actually causes less absorption to occur over the Caribbean and over the Atlantic Ocean. So it has some nonlinear effects that are going on. So this area of the world, if we're looking at the impact on the heating of the atmosphere, which is what I'm showing you, not the heating at the surface, the heating of the atmosphere, uh, is very unique and very special. And therefore, if we can't quantify these impacts from the fires correctly, it's going, we're going to do a hard job of figuring out the effects of heating of the atmosphere. Now, why may we be interested in heating the atmosphere? So let me show you what happens in this climate model. So the climate model, you can run it with these new emissions, trying to include the fires and the amounts better, and you get something like this. It will compute the amount of energy that the change of the atmosphere has due to your improved emissions, both in amount and time. And so this is, these are very complicated maps in the top left. These are hard to analyze. So what I did was I took a zonal average, just average where you have the South Pole here up to the North Pole here. So as you can see, in terms of this atmospheric energy, if you just look at the top right panel, which is the whole globe, it's leading to a small increase in energy of the atmosphere, a small warming the atmosphere. But if you look at the bottom two, which are done over different transects over Asia, you can notice that in Asia, in some areas, you're getting a decrease in energy. In other areas, you're getting a much larger increase in energy. So instead of just warming the atmosphere uniformly, in some areas, it's heating significantly. In other areas, it's cooling slightly. 
And this has an impact on a very important climate response. The impact is not on the surface temperature, which is where most of the research on climate change is being done. The impact is on rainfall. Now, have any of the people here been living in this area for long enough, like 40, 50 years? I mean, these, they're measurements that go back. For example, there was a recent paper that came out showing the monsoon arrival in India statistically over the last 50 years has been coming later and later. And when it comes, it's more intense. Now, I haven't looked at data. I don't know if there's been a published study on this here or not. But I'm wondering if people have been here long enough, is there any anecdotal knowledge or something like this of there being statistically relevant changes in the rainfall here? I'm not sure. I can't find the data on this yet. Maybe it's something interesting to look in. The model is predicting that there's a small global effect on rainfall. But if you look here over Southeast Asia, over the Western Pacific, Southern China, Northern Australia, and, uh, and India in the different seasons of the year, you have large increases and large decreases depending on the season of the year and where you are. When you take these zonal averages again, you'll notice this huge spike up. So you're leading to a large increase of rain here and a decrease of rain here and an increase of rain here. A shifting of the intertropical convergence zone. That is what controls the wet and dry seasonal change in this area. That the model, that's how the model is responding when you put in the more appropriate emissions. And throughout different regions of Asia, as these two slices are showing, you get a very large effect of up to 0 0.6 or up to 1.0 millimeters per day but that's averaged over a three-month period of time. So is this a cause? It seems like there's a correlation between this and potential changes in rainfall. Doesn't mean it's causation. There's not enough proof for that, but there's a correlation. So I think it's something we should look more into and see if these fires are maybe having an effect on the rainfall, which is then going to have an effect back on the fires. So just finally to show you how complex this can be, if we try to vary, remember I showed you before, the emissions still weren't capturing the time variation correctly. If we try to capture this time variation correctly, we wind up getting secondary effects on the zonal average over Asia as compared to the whole global zonal average that are much larger. And these secondary effects seem to show things more than just the timing of the major precipitation, but possibly hint at other secondary effects such as strength of precipitation. But this is, again, a much harder issue to play at, and it's for future research work. But I just wanted to leave you with this. So finally, uh, another picture as I wrap up. So this picture was taken by me when I was just flying back a few days ago from the end of the trip. Uh, this was taken over Hainan and shows the Vietnam, the Hanoi superplume, as it's so called in the literature. So downwind of Hanoi, which is a huge urban area, you get this massive plume of smoke. So you can see you have some white clouds here, and then you just have this huge gray area. I know the sun is sort of blotting it out, but this gray is really thick and very extensive and goes out to the horizon on the left-hand side here. So some, some conclusions, as you can read them there, that the haze is comprised of aerosols, which impact, I argue, both the climate system as well as human health. And the current estimates of emissions are too low for the current aerosols based on top-down measurements, which is a method of using models combined with measurements and that fires seem to potentially play a role in further closing these gaps because it seems like there are patterns that correlate and are consistent between the fires and the measurements and the uncertainties in them. And that when you use one of the world's most advanced climate models, that the physics of these changes, which is consistent with the way the model is behaving, seem to indicate that the impact is on precipitation, not surface temperature. So if we're interested to look at the climate impact, we need to find a way to consider precipitation as well as temperature. And that perturbations from this area of the world seem to contribute very strongly to changes in precipitation around the globe, whereas emissions perturbations from other areas like from Northern Asia or Europe or the U.S. would contribute more to temperature change around the globe. And so I'll just leave you with the final picture of what I took of what I hope we can prevent from occurring here. This was taken in April when I was flying over somewhere over northern India and Nepal. And you can see in the far distance over here, 
if you can see through the haze, this is Mount Everest. And the lights are on. You can actually see there's a plume of smoke here. So it's a combination of forest fire burning as well as the city of Kathmandu in this valley over here. And the AOD was measured by a friend of mine and a person that's worked with Professor Roth before, Arnico Pande. He has a measurement station there. He said the AOD on this day was about 1.6. So yes, you could have looked at the sun from the ground without hurting your eyes. And with that, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can we move to the next speaker, please? Everyone, uh, I'm Chinghai from the Majority Service Singapore. Now, Dr. Koen has given us a very good uh, presentation on how Indonesia forest fires of our region can affect the global and global and even future climate. Now, I'm going to bring you back more to immediate concern and more regional concern here to show you how Majority Service Singapore is using Earth observation satellite to monitor the fires and smoke haze situation over the ASEAN region. To start off with my presentation, I'll, I'll first go on to a quick history of haze and haze monitoring over Singapore and over our region. This will be followed by an overview of remote sensing and satellite. Next, I'll go on to how satellite data can be used to derive and detect hotspots and do haze detection. I'll finally conclude by showing you some examples of satellite images that we use to monitor recent transboundary haze. A quick history. Uh, the first serious episode of transboundary haze occurred quite way back in 1972. Since then, uh, Singapore, Max TV Singapore was the first uh, to speculate that the haze could come from fires over Indonesia like Sumatra, Kalimantan. This was later verified and confirmed by Singapore air crews that flew over the region who observed fires burning over this region. Since then, Singapore has been impacted by several serious haze episodes in past years like 82, 83, 1991, 1994, 1997, 1998, 2002, and 2006 episode that Dr. Cohen has mentioned just now. Yeah, that was a very bad case. And more recently, 2009. Throughout the years, as you can see, case is a big concern for Singapore. It has impacted us very frequently, and it has health concerns. So in the early 1990s, Met Service Singapore started to use uh, polar orbiting satellite data to help us monitor fires and smoke case monitoring. Since then, uh, Singapore has established itself as the regional center for fire and smoke haze monitoring for the ASEAN region. As the ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center, we are responsible for monitoring the smoke haze situation and fire and issuing the necessary warnings and alerts to help our member country to manage the fire and smoke haze situation. A quick overview of uh, remote sensing and satellites. Uh, as meteorologists, we collect both uh, in situ and remote sensing. Uh, data from in-situ and remote sensors. By in-situ, we mean that uh, sensors or equipment that are installed at the location uh, to measure the properties of air or water that they are in direct contact with. As for uh, remote sensors, we are referring to equipment like satellite, radar. These are equipment that monitors the atmosphere from afar without being in direct physical contact with the atmosphere that they are measuring. So, uh, in-situ measurements are by and large measurements of point data as because these point data, they have a lot of uh, spatial gaps. And so for those spaces that in between the measurement points, we do not have any measurements and data over there. And so this is where remote sensing comes in. Remote sensors like satellite and radar is able to cover a big area. And hence, this will fill up the data gaps that is left by the institute measurements. And satellite is one of the remote sensors that MetSurvey Singapore is using, not only for weather operation, but also for monitoring of fires and smoke haze. Weather satellites. How weather satellites uh, measure the atmosphere is by passively sensing the radiation energy that is emitted by the Earth. They are ma mainly measuring on the visible and infrared radiation. So different geographical features and objects, they emit and reflect visible and infrared radiation over a different spectrum. So by measuring the radiation over different wavelengths, we are able to collect a lot of interesting information about the atmosphere. And one of them is to help us detect 
where are the possible forest fires. Yeah. There are two main types of weather satellites that we use, the geostationary and the polar orbiting. For the geostationary, they are orbiting from east, west to east uh, at about the same speed as the Earth. So at every, every, at every instant, they are uh, at approximately the same point in the sky relative to Earth. They are at a height of about 36,000 kilometers, so they have a very wide coverage. However, the, the consequence is that the resolution from the geostationary satellites are much coarser in resolution. For the polar orbiting, they are orbiting from pole to pole at a height of about 850 kilometers. They are nearer to Earth, therefore they have a finer resolution. The, the downside is that they are actually collecting data at the same location only at about uh, two times per day. So it's much less frequent than uh, compared to a geostationary satellite. Geostationary satellite can collect data at about uh, every half to one hour. Yeah. So for Max Service Singapore, we are receiving data from both geostationary and polar orbiting satellites. For geostationary, we are receiving the MTSAT-2 from Japan and also receiving the phone in 2 d and phone in 2 e from China. As for polar orbiting, we are receiving a lot of uh, US satellites, NOAA-18, NOAA-19, as well as the uh, Aqua and Terra. Uh, a quick look at the sensors that are mounted on the polar orbiting satellites that we are receiving. They are mainly the MODIS, which are mounted on the Aqua and Terra satel satellite, and the ABHRR-3, which are mounted on the NOAA-18 and 19 satellites. Uh, as you can see, uh, by looking at the channels of, that, of the two sensors, they are quite different. Uh, MODIS has 36 channels, whereas for the ABHRR, it has only 6 channels. So this has an impact on the hotspot algorithm and detection. So when, when they come out and when, when we run, the, even though the basic principle behind the hotspot algorithm are quite similar, when we do a hotspot detection algorithm over these two different types of sensors, we will come up with quite different results in terms of the number of hotspots over a region. So in general, from our experience, the Aqua and Terra is able to give us uh, a lot more hotspot compared to what we get from the NOAA 18 and NOAA 19 satellites. Yeah. So we have talked a lot about hotspot. So what is a hotspot? Hotspot essentially image pixels whose brightness temperatures exceed a predefined threshold value. So from this definition, we know that hotspot does not equate to forest fire. There are a lot of other things that can cause hotspot. For example, any warm surfaces, uh, like maybe the hot sand over a sandy beach, uh, this could also cause hotspots, and they are not forest fires. Yeah. So even though hotspots do not equate to forest fires, by, by monitoring the number of hotspots everything, it gives us a very good indication of the level of fire activities around our region, and that helps us a lot in forewarning our neighboring countries of uh, outbreaks of haze, episode, transboundary, etc. So for the detection of hotspot, we are mainly using the 3.7 micro, micrometer channel. The channel is also known as the short wave infrared channel. And it has very high sensitivity to heat, hence it is easier to detect differences in temperature of both fires and the surrounding region. The 11 micrometer channel, also known as the long wave infrared, is commonly used to visualize cloud. It has very low sensitivity to heat and is unsuitable to detect fire. Having said that, uh, uh, Algorithms, uh, hotspot algorithms, make use of not only the 3.7 micrometers uh, channel, but also the 11 micron channel. For the 11 micron channel, the main uh, use is to help to reduce false detection of hotspot. Yeah. So these, uh, these uh, channels are available in a lot of uh, satellite radiometers, even on geostationary satellites. Yeah. So, so what, what is listed here is the process that we went through to come up with a hotspot that we actually put in our public website for the public and also for our uh, fellow me ASEAN members. So the first thing we do is we want to identify the cloud pixels. So because these are cloud pixels are areas that should not have any forest fire hotspot. So when we, when we, once we identify cloud pixels, you will mask out the area. Other than that, other than cloud pixels, we also want to identify water pixels. These are pre-known. So any, any areas under the, for the sea and water bodies that we know, we will mask it out as water pixels. So once all the cloud and the water pixels are masked out, when we do our hotspot detection, we will actually not consider all these areas. Yeah. Once you have done that, you will be go on to detect the hot pixels. And to do that, there are two different methods which I'll touch on later, the threshold and the contextual method. Once that has been done, we will classify the hotspots. We will classify the hot pixels in the hotspots. We will then flag and color code them. We will color code them as red, and then we will overlay them on the satellite imagery. So the red dot here is what we call the hotspot. They could or could not, they might or might not be forest fires. 
As I mentioned earlier, there are two types of uh, algorithms for hotspot detection. That is the traditional China threshold method and the contextual method. For the threshold method, it's pretty straightforward. What we do is to set a certain threshold value for a particular satellite channel, like for example, the 3.7 micron channel that I mentioned. And once a particular pixel has a value that exceeds the particular threshold, we will mark it as a hotspot. To, to further refine that, uh, people come up with things like a multi-channel threshold. So the multi-threshold channel basically makes use of more than the 3.7 micron channels. It takes into account other channels like the 11 microns that we mentioned, and this essentially helps to reduce uh, false detection of hotspots. Threshold method again. Uh, essentially for threshold method, it has a shortcoming. That is because um, over the region and over, over different seasons, the threshold setting will have to be tuned. Because like for example, in the forested areas, it is much cooler than a sandy area. So if, if there was to be a forest fire in, in, the forest, uh, in the forested area and the threshold was set too high, we might not detect the forest fire that happened in the forest fire. So to, in order for a threshold method to perform well, we have to tune it according to the areas, the region, and maybe even the seasons. Yeah. So that is why this is not a preferred method for MetSurvey Singapore, because the definition of the absolute threshold can be quite inconsistent and restrictive. It can also be quite time consuming and difficult to define all the different thresholds, and you've got to change it according to season, according to time, different areas. Yeah. Now we come to the contextual method. This is a method that is preferred by MetSurvey Singapore because it detects hotspots on more of a relative basis. What it does is it compares values of a possible fire with those of its immediate neighbors. If the contrast is large, the pixel is then identified as a hotspot. The contextual method is shell adaptive and automatically detect fires under different situations, different conditions. It is consistent over large areas and over time. The contextual method is able to detect fires in different environments based on contrast between the fires and background. And this is why Met Office Singapore has been using this contextual method for quite some time for our hotspot and smoke haze monitoring. Uh, this is just a, a good overview of the contextual method. Uh, it is essentially an extension of the threshold method that I mentioned earlier. So for the stage one, it's essentially what we do for threshold method. Basically, it's to select pixels that are potential fires. But the contextual method brings this further and extend it by getting a stage two which is to confirm or reject potential fire pixels by comparing with uh, neighboring pixels. When we do that, what we do is we calculate the mean and standard deviation for the neighboring pixels. And then we do a comparison of the, of the brightness temperature in the potential fire pixel. And then we compare that with the standard and mean of the neighboring pixels. So if the difference is sufficiently large, we will then mark it as a hotspot. If not, it, that will be rejected. Yeah. So this is how we finally come up with a hotspot that is marked in our final products for members of public and also for our fellow ASEAN members. I've done with uh, hotspot detection. But, but what we need to do now further is we also want to know the area of smoke haze. So we want to know whether smoke haze has, is spreading towards us or, or even neighboring countries like Peninsula Malaysia. So in order to do that, smoke haze is a bit of a manual interpretation. Manual interpretation. It needs a human being looking at the satellite imageries, looking at all of the features, and then decides that that particular area might have some uh, smoke haze there. And in order to help a human being do this interpretation, what we do is we come up with a composite image, like you see here. The, the, how we do that is by combining three different channels from the satellite data. For the NOAA satellite, they are using the AVHRR data. We are using the Channel 1, Channel 2, and Channel 4. For the MODIS data, we are seeing channel 1, 2, and 31. So the basic principle behind this is that uh, for cloud and smoke, they have a very high reflectance in, in the visible and near infrared region. However, the main differentiation between cloud and smoke haze is at the thermal infrared region. They have a very big difference reading for smoke and cloud. So by, by doing this kind of combination, what we end up in is that for smoke haze region, you have a very high value in the red and the green channels. Whereas for the blue channels, the color values will be a bit low. So what end up you can see here is that smoke haze area will, will be a bit yellowish, orangish. So then contrast that with a, uh, with a cloud, you have very high values at all the three channels. So cloud in the composite, in the composite, trend, in the composite image will appear as white patches. So in, in that way, we are able to differentiate easy, easier between a smoke haze region and also a cloud. Yeah. 
him talk about how, how good a uh, hotspot and stone case reduction is. It, however, it still has some main limitations. One of the main limitations is, of course, cloud cover. If an area is under a uh, thick cloud cover, basically the satellite will not be able to measure any properties at the surface. So for areas that are obscured by cloud cover, we will not be able to determine the hotspot or the smoke haze situation over there. This is a very big limitation. So whenever there's a very cloudy situation, it's very hard for us to determine what is the current uh, forest fire smoke haze situation. The second limitation, of course, is the edge of scan. Edge of scan is, uh, is mainly applicable for the two sensors that we are talking about the ABHRR and also the body sensor because uh, the, the resolution at best they are able to achieve, achieve is about one kilometer and that is directly underneath the satellite. However, when, when it moves to the edge of the satellite path, right, the, the resolution could be as close as about six kilometers. And because of that, when you apply a hotspot algorithm, right, it might end up with an uh, under detection of uh, forest fires. So some forest fire that is too small on, might, be, might not be detected. Other than that, the third one, of course, is the sun glint. Sun glint basically, it can affect both hotspot detection and smoke haze. However, when you, run, when you do a hotspot algorithm, as I mentioned just now, the contextual method will try to filter out uh, hotspot that has been forced from sun glint that has been falsely detected as a hotspot. So, however, even this can be done, but for smoke haze, if you can see here, this is the yellowish patch here, which is a quite obvious sun glint. Uh, as, as I mentioned just now, when you do a composite image, the smoke haze will appear yellowish. So when you look at this here, you, you will not be able to tell whether, uh, you'll be harder to tell whether it's a sanglin or it's a smoke haze. Of course, for trade majorities, we are able to see that this is quite obviously a sanglin. But even though we know it's a sanglin, but what about the smoke haze situation at, the smoke, at this sanglin region? We basically, we will not be able to tell. So the sanglin will mark out this area, and we are not able to determine what is the smoke haze situation over there. Uh, I think we have talked a lot about this now. I think we will bring you forward to uh, look at some recent transboundary haze. Uh, what you see here, of course, is the end product that we put out in our website, which is the composite image plus overlay of the hotspot. Uh, this is the image of the mid-June. In the mid-June, uh, there was transboundary haze affecting western parts of Singapore, western part of the peninsula Malaysia. As you can see here, it's marked out here in the center here. Smoke haze uh, at around uh, 18 of June. So, Hotspot, there was a lot of hotspot in the uh, central Sumatra and smoke haze you can see spreading across the Straits of Malacca. At, the, at this moment, it has not reached Peninsula Malaysia yet. But in the second day, you can see that the smoke plumes has actually spread and start to affect the western coast of uh, Peninsula Malaysia. And during this period of time, uh, API or air quality over Peninsula Malaysia reached unhealthy levels. We look at the Third and fourth day, you can see smoke haze uh, still persisting over and affecting Peninsula Malaysia. Well, when it comes to the fourth day, you can see there's a big patch of cloud here, uh, which actually makes it hard for us to determine why the smoke haze situation over there. Okay. We go, go to mid-August. In mid-August, there was an outbreak of transboundary haze. This time, it affected the northern part of Peninsula Malaysia. You can see the smoke haze also here. And when you look at the second day, you can see the smoke haze spreading and affecting more towards the northwestern part of northwestern part of Peninsula Malaysia. But for the central part of Peninsula Malaysia, the haze stops at somewhere around the middle of the Straits of Malacca. Yeah. For the third and fourth day, you can see that uh, smoke haze is still lingering over and affecting the neighboring countries. This is more recent satellite images uh, in September this month. Uh, for this uh, September 3rd, you can see uh, I blown up the image to make it clearer. You can see hotspot here, and you can see also those uh, yellowish streaks from the southeast to northwest direction. These are basically smoke plumes. So, by looking at the smoke plumes, uh, we can more or less confirm that these hotspots are more or less confirmed to be a forest fire. During this period of time, 3rd of September, Singapore was affected by slight to moderate haze. You know. So this is even more recent, 23rd of September, you can see the smoke plumes here also. Uh, you notice that when you look at this image, the image here and the image here, this image seems sharper and this image seems a bit blurrier. This is the edge of scan effect that I mentioned just now because the area here is actually nearly is at the edge of the satellite scan, which is why the image resolution is coarser and appears a little bit more blurry. Yeah. So, so that, that's how eventually uh, how we perform our fires and smoke haze monitoring. Of course, other than that, because today's talk is 
more about satellite. We make use of a lot about on in situ uh, sensors like direct human observation at Sumatra, Kalimantan, or even automatic weather sensor to help us further verify that the whatever is indicated here is, is the is the ground truth. So you also try to ground truth because no matter how a uh, satellite is an indirect measurement, sometimes it needs a lot of interpretation and that, that the ground truth is still necessary. Like, yeah. Okay. With that I end my presentation. Thank you.